Thank you for being with us today, either on-site or online. I'm delighted to welcome today Professor Mathieu del Perrao. Uh, Mathieu is Professor and Head of the Laboratory of Biomolecular Modeling here at EPFL. His talk today is entitled From Integrated Structural Biology to Bioengineering. You know the format we have, so the talk is going to last approximately 40, 45 minutes. We then have ample of time questions at the end. Uh, Matteo agreed to take your questions if they're urgent during his talk. Otherwise, feel free to put them in the chat if you're online or uh, log them down if you're in the room and we take them up at the end of the presentation. Before we dive into the presentation, I would like to thank Matteo, of course, for his availability. And once again, the entire CIC for making this happen today. So, Matteo, floor is all yours. Good. Just to remember these uh, chat. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, uh, Jan and all of the CIS team for the invitation here. So uh, I'm uh, I'm happy to be here in person. I couldn't come uh, last year when it was still in uh, remote mode, and uh, but actually here yeah, uh, in person is going to be much better. Today, I'm going to give you a, a kind of an overview about the activities that we do uh, in my lab. And it's going to be a kind of journey from uh, structural biology uh, to bioengineering, as the title said. Uh, I'm Matteo Peraro. I'm the head of uh, the laboratory for biomolecular modeling. And uh, I'm also the affiliated with the Institute of Bioengineering on the uh, School of Life Science side. And, uh, and actually, since this is uh, uh, supposed to uh, know your neighbors, so this is actually where uh, my lab is uh, located in campus, not too far from here. So we are split in uh, two buildings uh, on the SV side, AAB building, so where we have our dry operation, the computational activities on the ground floor, and then uh, uh, the wet activities instead are in the AI building at the second floor. So we, our lab is a kind of a, split the personality at the moment uh, uh, between the computational and experimental work like you will see uh, during the presentation. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, the activities of my lab uh, so revolves around uh, uh, the common theme of integrative structural biology that I hope will become uh, clear during uh, uh, the presentation what is actually uh, meaning. Uh, we look uh, especially at the structure and the uh, function of large macromolecular uh, assemblies and especially their uh, membrane association. And in, in doing that, uh, we try to develop uh, some intelligent methods to uh, approach this uh, uh, problem. And eventually, as you will see at the end of my talk, uh, we use some of these uh, structural uh, information that we gain uh, to engineer some of this system for some uh, uh, bioengineering application. And uh, uh, we focus in the lab mainly on protein. We like protein and as you know, so protein are, are the, the, the principal building block of life. They are governing all uh, uh, the processes uh, that uh, uh, in every organism. And uh, since uh, the 60s, uh, in the 60s, we discovered how to uh, uh, solve the structure of these beautiful uh, polymers that folds uh, uh, in uh, many different structures using uh, X-ray crystallography. And since then, uh, so you know, we collected uh, many different structures, almost 200,000 that are deposited here in the protein data bank. And uh, uh, they have uh, different shapes uh, and uh, they, uh, exploit many different uh, biological functions for, uh, from uh, uh, transport of metal uh, ions uh, to enzymatic uh, uh, catalysis, uh, uh, protein synthesis, uh, uh, manipulation of the genome, uh, like the CRISPR-Cas9 that actually we converted in a, a great machinery for gene editing. But uh, the bottom line is that since the beginning, the 60s, uh, uh, the, the main dogma or paradigm in structural biology is that these structures are very important because from the structure, uh, we can understand uh, the function, the biological function, that is actually what we are after. And uh, this is even uh, more true in uh, uh, the case uh, uh, when a protein uh, uh, gets together, specifically interact 
to form a huge molecular machineries, uh, like, uh, for instance, the most uh, majestic example, the nuclear core complex uh, here in the East, where 10 of thousands of molecules or proteins that come together and they are able to self-assemble uh, uh, to create uh, these uh, beautiful machinery that uh, are regu is regulating the trafficking of uh, molecules in and out of the uh, nuclear envelope. And uh, actually, this is uh, uh, some of the challenges uh, that the structural biology has to face uh, uh, in the future. Uh, so we are not uh, there yet. We are not able yet today uh, to solve, uh, like we solve uh, a single proteins, uh, the structure of these bigger complexes. But these are the challenges uh, of the year to come. But uh, actually, we are living in a some very exciting times uh, for structural biology. I have to say much, much more exciting than uh, 20 years ago, for instance, when I started to do this uh, uh, job in research, uh, because we are in the middle of several uh, revolutions. The first one uh, is the so-called uh, resolution revolution uh, that is triggered by the advances in uh, cryo-electron microscopy. And uh, this is actually due uh, basically to an introduction in 2012 of uh, some new uh, detectors that can capture electrons directly. And these are implemented in these uh, I end microscope, cryos for Thermo Fisher. We have two of them in campus finally at the uh, Dubochet Center for Imaging that we share with uh, UNIL and the Lelman area. But uh, the, the bottom line is that now with this technology uh, in cryo EM, we can finally solve uh, large complexes uh, at the resolution uh, that is uh, in the order of one angstrom. This means, as you can see in the figure here, that we can solve uh, atomic position uh, with uh, high accuracy. And this means that we can really understand the biochemistry and the biophysics of these, uh, of these uh, complexes. And uh, cryo-electron microscopy is really uh, set to become the golden standard uh, in structural biology already. And it's overtaking uh, X-ray crystallography in, in few years. Uh, and is actually uh, the hope and the promise is that it's going to help the solution of this big machinery at the cellular level. Then the second uh, great revolution that is more recent, uh, a few years ago, is uh, the rise of artificial intelligence for the application in the field of protein structure prediction. So this is a very old problem starting in the 60s uh, when we uh, started to solve structures in uh, is how to uh, computationally predict from the sequence of the structure of these proteins. So in this uh, CASP competition uh, that uh, started uh, almost uh, uh, 30 years ago, people have tried uh, uh, for a long time to really push forward methods to solve this problem. And uh, pretty much, as you can see from this plateau, nothing happened until uh, very recently. Until uh, uh, 2016 and 18, CASP 12 and 13, uh, when we were also involved in uh, the assessment of uh, uh, the, the, the new methods and the results where some new methods like evolutionary couplings uh, and uh, machine learning uh, approaches started to uh, be applied to this problem. And, uh, but it was only uh, two years ago in 2020 at the end that uh, uh, the big revolution happened. And when DeepMind, maybe all you know, uh, know about this, this uh, uh, presented the second version of their AlphaFold uh, deep learning based method for uh, solving this problem. And pretty much uh, they solved the protein. So getting a, a prediction that, as you can see here, are almost identical equivalent to experimental uh, structure. And the promise uh, is that uh, uh, with this technology, so we can uh, really have a larger uh, structural database already much larger than the protein data bank. Uh, we might cover many different organisms, maybe all the sequences that are deposited in human plot. And uh, of course, so always people uh, ask me, so, okay, now structural biologists are out of work. Uh, so there's not, not nothing uh, much left to do. This is not true because, uh, so these predictions are great, but uh, uh, there are also some limitation in this technology. First of all, not all the prediction as, uh, are as good as this one. Uh, some of them are not very high uh, accuracy. And then there are other um, problems in structural biology that are still uh, untouched. For instance, uh, uh, the role of a post relational modification, uh, disordered region, uh, the assembly of different uh, uh, proteins uh, uh, together. And uh, the fact that these proteins are not a static object, but are dynamic objects, okay? 
Uh, but of course, this is a great news. So we have uh, an additional resource that we can play with uh, in structural biology. And then the third uh, revolution that is kind of ongoing since uh, a decade or so is the fact that we can uh, do perform a molecular simulation at the atomistic level to produce uh, molecular movies of these biological complexes. We have today very accurate uh, force field for the treatment of the intra intermolecular interaction that allow us to do uh, molecular movies of uh, these proteins uh, in a, a realistic uh, uh, environment condition and not uh, the artificial condition of uh, uh, the experiments. Uh, so for instance, in this case, uh, a protein that interacts with the membrane with the, the, the proper uh, post-plasation modification. And this is actually thanks to the advances is also in HPC computing uh, that we are able to sample a, a large conformational space of these uh, proteins. Also in this, uh, in this uh, uh, domain, uh, I anticipate that uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, already now, but most likely in the future will, uh, uh, will play a major role for uh, uh, future advancement. Okay, all uh, uh, these uh, revolutions that are ongoing uh, are kind of uh, changing uh, the, the, the initial, the current uh, paradigm, the dogma of structural biology that uh, one structure, one function, okay? That was kind of crystallized by the fact that we had, uh, we were linked to X-ray crystallography that was uh, sold in uh, really one structure at the time. But already with cryo-EM, we see that uh, these uh, uh, proteins uh, assemblies uh, are living uh, in multiple states and even more extremely so they they may be uh, span uh, in a in a continuum uh, of states uh, in this uh, free energy landscape and today we have uh, techniques uh, at the uh, experimental level uh, with the cryo electron microscopy and uh, at the computational level with the, uh, molecular simulation or even ai applied to these uh, uh, techniques that allow us to explore maybe more uh, uh, exhaustively this uh, conformational landscape. And these uh, uh, likely will help uh, to address uh, uh, the uh, function, the biological function of uh, much larger complexes at the cellular level. And uh, actually, this is one of the aim of what we do in the lab that uh, I call integrative modeling applied to structural biology. Here, the idea is that uh, we wanted to get to the uh, models that represent a, a biological structure, large biological structure. And for doing that, uh, so we, we needed to put together, to integrate the data uh, from many different sources and different resolution. Uh, for instance, uh, if you have a big structure, so maybe you might have a high resolution structure of the individual pieces. From uh, different sources uh, that uh, you can integrate uh, together with a uh, volumetric map uh, uh, at the lower resolution, uh, uh, integrate with also some uh, uh, structural flexibility that you can gather from experiments like NMR or molecular dynamics, uh, and link these with uh, all sorts of uh, uh, spatial, spatial connectivities that uh, you can get from a biochemical, biophysical uh, assay. Okay. And uh, uh, developing methods that can integrate uh, in, in a consistent and efficient way all this information, of course, might play a role in uh, solving uh, the, uh, the, the structure and function of uh, uh, big uh, complexes. And along the years, uh, so in the lab, we've uh, been uh, busy with uh, the, the investigation of several systems. Here you have a few vignettes in the, from the past years where we use different sources of, uh, of data, cryo electron microscopy. SACS uh, data uh, membrane association assay to uh, kind of a progress in our understanding of uh, some of big system like the antigen protein that is involved in neurodegenerative disease. This CAP1 and DPX21 uh, any case involved in gene regulation and uh, coenzyme Q symptom that is uh, associated with the synthesis of a coenzyme Q a very hydrophobic molecule uh, that uh, uh, present in our organism in all mitochondria. But today I don't have the time to go uh, and in the details of these uh, uh, studies, uh, but I rather wanted to focus on some um, new methods that we put forward, uh, let's say intelligent method since we are at the CIS uh, seminar that we put, uh, uh, we, we propose 
uh, to treat some outstanding problems in the uh, integrative modeling applied to structural biology. And the first one is uh, the problem of fitting uh, models, uh, structures of uh, proteins or, or biomolecules in general within uh, uh, cryo electron microscopy maps uh, uh, generated from, uh, from cryo EM or tomography, for instance, so that have a low resolution though. Uh, because I told you, so if uh, your sample is well behaving uh, and uh, you are able to have uh, uh, optimize your grid nicely, so with the cryo EM in these days, uh, you can push the resolution to atomic uh, detail, like in this case with a single particle uh, analysis. And this is uh, for resolution that, uh, for your reference, are below, uh, let's say, four or three angst. Okay, here. There's nothing much to do, so we can build a reliably already model. But if the resolution uh, is not uh, so high, and this can happen in the case of your sample, maybe is uh, uh, conformational or heterogeneous, too flexible uh, to really average all the images and get to this high resolution, or you are using cryo-electron microscopy in uh, the uh, tomography mode, uh, so the resolution is going to be maybe one order of magnitude lower than that, in the order of uh, 10 or higher uh, angst. Okay, so uh, cryo electron tomography is, is different from a single particle cryo EM because here, instead of uh, imaging uh, uh, one single protein uh, that is uh, uh, reconstituted in vitro and uh, in your sample is uh, only alone, here you are imaging with a microscope, uh, so thin lamellas of, uh, of, of cells. Uh, where you, you try to, to reconstruct the structure of uh, some uh, proteins or a protein assembly uh, within, in situ, within uh, the physiological condition of uh, the cell that uh, capture in that particular moment. Okay, in all these cases, the resolution is not great and you need methods to, to fit uh, atomic models within the maps. And to solve this problem, uh, with, uh, we uh, propose uh, this uh, new approach, actually Sylvain, a former PhD student in the lab that recently graduated, uh, developed this uh, MAD uh, method that stands for uh, macromolecular descriptors. Actually here we borrow some concepts from, uh, um, from image recognition from uh, uh, computer vision. Uh, and we adapt this uh, on uh, the three-dimensional uh, uh, case of uh, uh, electron density map. Okay, so the problem here is uh, you have a, a kind of a target density at the low resolution, and you have a multiple subunits uh, that you know at the atomistic level that you wanted to fit within the map to find what is the best uh, model uh, uh, interpreting these experimental data. So it's like a, a three-dimensional puzzle, if you want. And uh, for treating the system, uh, so we generate uh, here uh, some uh, descriptors uh, that uh, are associated with the uh, uh, local uh, uh, maxima of the density in uh, the subunit and the, and, the, and the target density here uh, that are rotational invariant. And by matching these uh, uh, two uh, descriptors, we can uh, localize uh, and uh, score them in a way that we can uh, uh, gradually fit uh, uh, one by one all the different pieces within uh, the total mass. And then after a little bit of refinement, usually we can uh, recapitulate the uh, right solution that most of the time is uh, just unique uh, that uh, will better represent uh, the uh, low resolution cryo electron microscopy data. Okay, so we as always, uh, uh, with new methods, uh, we uh, we benchmark this uh, on a synthetic uh, data set, and uh, against some uh, some of the state of the art software that are treating similar problems, like like a temp Y and uh, imp the integrative modeling uh, platform. And as you can see here in twenty examples, we are doing uh, pretty fine. So the, the the software is very fast, so we can solve these uh, puzzles structural puzzle in a uh, matter of uh, minutes. And uh, uh, actually here, uh, the, uh, the, the deviation that we get from the ground through the real structure that uh, we have is very small. So in the order of less than uh, one angstrom. That uh, for this kind of uh, uh, task uh, is very remarkable. In principle, we can get uh, uh, real uh, models that fit the experimental data. And also in this, uh, uh, in this example uh, down here with uh, 
uh, this receptor that is actually a real case with a real uh, cryo-electron microscopy density. So we could fit many different subunits uh, in one shot in uh, the density. Uh, most importantly uh, for this method, and here I uh, recall again the notion of uh, dynamics uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, is the fact that this uh, uh, software, this method can be applied uh, uh, in dynamic mode. Okay, so I told you before that proteins are not static objects, uh, even though so we are kind of used to, uh, to see them as uh, one single uh, unit. Uh, but they are moving, they have a multiple conformational state. Here, uh, we are playing with uh, the Groyel chaperone, that is actually a big uh, cage made of uh, 14 of these uh, different units. And instead of uh, fitting uh, uh, the unit, uh, a static uh, unit uh, at once, uh, now we kind of explore the conformational landscape of uh, uh, these uh, subunits uh, with the molecular simulation, the one that I showed you before. And as you can see here, so we can uh, uh, really list uh, many different conformations uh, that we can represent with some uh, uh, relevant uh, cluster centers. Uh, here are seven conformations that uh, would uh, uh, optimally represent uh, these conformational states. And the nice thing is that now we can apply MAD, our method, uh, to these uh, extended conformational ensemble. And just by looking at the, the MAD score, so we can select uh, the structure that can uh, best fit uh, the experimental data, the cryo-electron microscopy at the intermediate resolution here is uh, around uh, six or seven length of resolution. You see that this uh, conformation number five is the one that uh, is uh, uh, indicated by the MAD score and eventually is also correlated with the fact that this is uh, as the best uh, RMSD with the uh, ground truth of uh, this uh, system. Uh, of, to note is also the fact that uh, we can, uh, the, the method is able also to reconstruct uh, uh, kind of uh, reasonable structures also with uh, all the other conformations that of course are not fitting well, uh, the, the, cryo, the initial cryo electron microscopy maps, but uh, in principle can represent uh, other potential states uh, for that uh, uh, chaperone assembly in, in the long run. Okay, so th th this is just uh, to, to, to show that uh, this method, I think, so might help uh, in the future when uh, uh, cryo electron microscopy data at low intermediate resolution, especially in the tomography mode, uh, might uh, need to be interpreted and, uh, and uh, to fit some atomistic model uh, on it to. Uh, understand better their biological function. Okay, so that was one first vignette. And a second one that I want to share with you uh, is a concern instead the, 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 the problem of understanding the connectivity of these uh, different pieces. Uh, we can do that uh, from uh, a, a, an experimental side. And also we, we run some biochemical experiments, for instance, mutagenesis, Sorry, I spoiled the, the, the next one, but uh, some, some uh, mutagenesis. Uh, uh, yeah, and this is very helpful. Sometimes uh, this really helps uh, uh, to identify the, some uh, interacting uh, interfaces between protein and protein. But that would be also very nice uh, to be able to predict uh, these uh, interacting interfaces from scratch with some computational method. And this is actually the, the problem that uh, uh, Lucien uh, in the lab, so a PhD student, uh, also in the audience here, uh, tackled during uh, his uh, PhD, uh, PhD work. Uh, he implemented very recently uh, PESTO uh, that stands actually for a protein structure uh, transformer uh, that is implemented in this uh, web server uh, within uh, the EPFL domain. And actually wants to really uh, predict uh, protein interacting interfaces uh, from scratch computationally. Uh, for doing this, so now the, the structure of the protein here is uh, uh, actually represented as a, a cloud uh, of points that are centered really on the atomic, uh, at atomic position here. What we really want to do is uh, to preserve uh, an atomistic representation of these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, proteins, okay? And uh, the only features that we use uh, uh, in this uh, uh, model 
is the, 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 the element name of the atoms. Nothing else than that. No other parameters like mass, relative static, hydrophobicity. Uh, we wanted to keep the model very, uh, very, uh, very simple. Uh, and, uh, and then after that, we define a geometric uh, uh, transformer operation that uh, actually is acting on these uh, uh, clouds of points uh, and update their states based on uh, the local uh, neighborhood, like uh, shown here. And, uh, and we do that, uh, uh, we apply this transformer operation uh, gradually to expand the neighborhood, starting uh, very small from uh, uh, a small spherical uh, uh, region of uh, three angstroms, so containing uh, roughly eight uh, uh, ne uh, nearest neighbor, and uh, gradually we expanded this up to 64 nearest ne neighbors in a way that uh, to include uh, uh, gradually much more information. And eventually, so we pull down the information at the atomistic level, at the residue level, uh, and uh, we get uh, uh, the uh, return of the probability of interaction just by uh, that we visualize by uh, a color scale here from uh, uh, zero to one. So how this look like visually, so when uh, you try an, uh, one uh, uh, prediction on the web server, it, it's something like that. So you have your protein of interest, uh, you're depicted in blue and, and red, and, uh, and you have uh, some prediction. Uh, so here the yellow protein is actually added a posteriori just for you to realize that the prediction here for this protein-protein interaction is quite good, okay? 96%. And it's not good only for this one, but also in general. Uh, we benchmarked this uh, uh, new method against some uh, state of the art methods of the past, like Spider and Cyber. And uh, we are doing uh, uh, pretty well. Uh, but also, we are doing well in comparison with more recent methods like uh, Massive uh, that uh, use uh, also geometric deep learning, uh, but using a protein surface. Uh, to treat uh, a sim and the similar problem. So developed uh, this method uh, uh, by one of our colleagues, so Bruno Correa uh, at the, my institute, okay? So the nice thing about uh, this model, uh, as I told you, so we wanted to keep it simple, uh, is also the, the fact that we can retrain these not only to discover protein-protein interfaces, but also interfaces of protein with other biomolecules like uh, nuclei acids, uh, ion, uh, ligand, lipids, uh, and all sorts of... Uh, uh, different things. And here you see some of the relevant cases where, for instance, of this transcription factor, we can really nicely predict and discriminate the interface for the DNA on one side and the ion, the zinc ion on the other side. This protein is interacting uh, simultaneously with the protein and the DNA, and we can discriminate the two interfaces very nicely here, um, the red interface here and there. And uh, Lipida also is working okay. Uh, in this case, a transporter, uh, so we can identify the lipid pocket. Uh, of course, as you can see on the on the left, uh, so the performance of the model is not as accurate for lipid protein predi uh, uh, prediction as the others. But this is actually due to the fact that in the training set we don't have uh, enough uh, protein lipid complex, so we can play uh, during training only with a few hundreds of them. Of course, so with more complex uh, so also this prediction is set to, to increase. I'll leave you with uh, this uh, final example here that I find uh, very nice. Uh, this is a, a prediction for uh, an interacting interface on an antibody, okay? Usually antibody interact with uh, other proteins. And uh, when we run the protein-protein interaction, we don't have any uh, positive results. Instead, uh, we have a positive results for a protein nuclear acid interaction. And these, in fact, in, in this particular case, this antibody is special because it interacts with RNA and not other proteins. So it's particularly remarkable that uh, the, the, the model uh, is actually learning something uh, that is quite deep uh, regarding the, uh, the, the features, the physical chemical features of the interacting interface. We don't know how it does that, but uh, it is good to, uh, to see that. The other important things of the model is that it's super fast. Uh, so you can see here that on GPU, so we take uh, more time to load the structure rather than doing uh, the actual computation. And because of this, uh, we can really apply the model to large conformational assemblies. 
uh, ensembles, uh, like the one that we can generate for molecular simulation, trajectories of uh, uh, these proteins. And this is actually what we did here in this case. We took uh, uh, 20 uh, proteins, uh, the static initial proteins from uh, uh, the, the, the validation set. Um, these are the blue bars. And for each of them, we run a longer uh, molecular dynamic simulation in the order of one microseconds. And as you can see here, and uh, represented in this uh, specific case, for uh, most of them, at, at least the one for which the prediction in the static case was not very good, uh, prediction in uh, the dynamic ensemble, the large conformational ensemble, are actually much better. Okay, so there is an improvement. So meaning that uh, with this uh, uh, approach, with this method, we can really also uh, discover uh, for unbound uh, proteins, uh, states, uh, some uh, uh, pockets that are potential uh, interacting surfaces, but are not uh, so evident from the static, uh, the static uh, conformation. And uh, another uh, nice consequence of uh, the fact that the, 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 the method is very fast is that we can also apply these uh, uh, to uh, uh, at the prote proteome scale, okay? So this is an application where we're using, uh, we're using uh, the, the whole uh, human proteome uh, that uh, we can get from uh, the alpha fold to prediction on the ABI database. Uh, so we have uh, pretty much uh, in the human proteome 20 or uh, 20,000 structure. Here we are just dealing with 7,000 of them. So that um, in our view are the high quality models that we can gather. So as I told you before, so alpha fold is not uh, solved in the whole problem. You see only one third of these prediction for the human proteome are, are of very high quality. And, and as a validation here in this, uh, uh, in this uh, graph, uh, you can see that our predictions are kind of correlating very well with uh, the annotated function and features that you can find in uh, the Uniprot, for instance. Uh, if you, for instance, look at this uh, transmembrane protein here, so we have uh, that uh, most of uh, uh, our prediction are dealing with the protein lipid interfaces. And this is good for a transmembrane protein, uh, uh, of course. Okay, so then also if you look at mutation, we discover that the most of the mutation, half of them are actually uh, located in these uh, uh, interacting interfaces, and uh, and half um, of them are uh, of pathogenic uh, uh, origin, so associated with some uh, disease. And also we can also look at the kind of how these uh, interfaces uh, uh, cross uh, uh, talk uh, among uh, among each other. Um, so if we can also go more specifically and uh, look at the uh, at the um, every given structure now we have uh, a technology that uh, by which we can uh, build uh, a known structure like in this case this human receptor tra6 uh, in this dynamic form with alpha fold and then applying paste so we can identify very quickly the region uh, for protein-protein interaction or protein-lipid interaction since it's a transmembrane protein and of course this is a kind of a quick and a very useful method to really design quickly new experiments in the lab and, and discover new biology. I think that this might be very useful for many people to advance the functional knowledge of a specific protein of interest. Okay, so in the last 10 minutes or so of my talk, so I'm going to give you an example how we use some of this knowledge, the structural functional knowledge of one of these systems uh, solved by integrative modeling for some bioengineering application. And this is the case of poor forming toxin. So this is a system that we studied since I came here at the EPFL. So these are bacterial uh, uh, proteins that get together, form a force at the host membrane to spread the infection. Uh, the system in particular that we have been uh, studying uh, together with my dear colleague at uh, the SB Kizu uh, Group is aerolyzing. And so after years of work, uh, so using uh, uh, the, the older generation of integrity modeling uh, tools uh, and also the recent advance of uh, uh, cryo-electromicroscopy, we can come up with uh, the final mature structure of the pore. Okay, that looks like uh, this and it's very nice because uh, it's characterized by a completely new folding uh, 
structure motive of the, the assembly, this uh, uh, double beta barrel. And uh, what is also interesting is the fact that these uh, pretty much uh, five years ago or so, we discovered that this uh, core uh, can has also nice uh, uh, properties uh, as, a, as a sensor, a molecular sensor. Okay, it can, uh, in this case, uh, discriminate uh, DNA uh, oligonucleotides. And uh, this is a, a concept that is um, uh, back uh, from the 90s uh, where biological cores can be used uh, to really detect the gap information about uh, the analytes that uh, uh, translocate through the core uh, when you apply a voltage. Just by looking at the current in many different conformations, you can get the information about the analyzer that is translocated. And this uh, technology uh, now is uh, implemented in uh, devices from uh, uh, Oxford Nanocore, for instance, for DNA sequencing, actually. Uh, you can do that uh, uh, on a very small chip. And uh, actually, uh, arolysin has a similar properties that can, in principle, be uh, exploited in, in that direction. And uh, leveraging our structural knowledge about the, 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 the core, and uh, using molecular simulation and structural studies. Uh, and this is the work of Chan Chao uh, in the lab that is now kind of independent uh, on a, a, a Prima Fellowship at EPFL. We discovered that actually these uh, sensing abilities are given by these uh, two constriction uh, along the lumen of the core, one here at the top and one at the bottom. Okay, and we went further and uh, we uh, engineered uh, first in silico and then in vitro in the lab uh, some variation of these uh, uh, two constrictions for the pore in order to better understand the conduction and optimize uh, the sensing properties for some uh, uh, specific task. We found out that actually this constriction is the most important one for sensing and actually it shouldn't be not uh, should be preserved. And now, at the moment, we, we are uh, trying to uh, explore uh, these uh, for application to protein sequencing. That is uh, uh, the next uh, big challenge in the field. Uh, but uh, for today's presentation, I decided to give you an example of another application that uh, uh, maybe that is uh, the application of nanopores uh, the, to the problem of data storage. Okay, so we all know that. Uh, 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 we are producing data at the uh, extremely high uh, pace. And if uh, co we continue like that, uh, so soon uh, uh, it will be pretty much impossible uh, to store data on uh, the existing technologies based on uh, silicon or magnetic tape. This will become soon unsustainable like many other uh, activities uh, of our society. And that's why so people uh, are, are already looking since many years uh, on alternatives uh, support like uh, biological uh, system, DNA for instance, because in DNA you can store a, a higher density of information rather than uh, with silicon or magnetic tape and you can store that for longer. So DNA can last for hundreds of years. But there are some limitations because you cannot play the chemical space of the DNA is not huge. That's why so people came up with other ideas. So using these sequence defining information of polymers as an alternative, uh, because of the chemical space that you can store is much larger. Uh, and you can apply these for many different applications. And of course, the, 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 the difficult part is that uh, you need a very expensive and complicated techniques to decode the information that you store in these, uh, in these polymers. You need a tandem mask spectrometry that is, is, is expensive, needs an expert user to run it, uh, it's destructive and, uh, and, uh, and it's not really portable. Okay, so we ask the question, can we use these uh, biological cores for uh, this particular task to read uh, information encoded in these uh, polymers. And for doing that, we team up with uh, Alessandro Radenovic at our institute and uh, uh, Jean-Francois Lutz uh, in Strasbourg, that is actually one of the uh, world leader in uh, the production and the design of these uh, informational polymers that he can uh, produce uh, to automate the solid phase synthesis, uh, creating these uh, long uh, uh, sequence define a poly phosphodiester uh, chain. And for the specific case, we tailor uh, a, a polymer designer that uh, optimally would fit uh, with our core. Well, here you see that we have some uh, oligonucleotides that are capping at the extremity of the polymer. And we play 
uh, with uh, the electrostatic and the bulkiness of these uh, single uh, blocks uh, to encode uh, uh, different bits of information. Okay, and when we try to locate uh, these uh, uh, particular peptide on a uh, polymer, sorry, on the on the this variation of uh, the aerolizing core. So these are the, the typical uh, current uh, traces that we get. So where you can appreciate uh, the 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 block the current block at here that are actually uh, very uh, corresponding to the different uh, uh, blocks that we have here. Every uh, spike here, every level uh, can be associated with uh, the different blocks that we design. Meaning that in principle, we can read this information at the molecular level, almost at a mystic level. So this is kind of unprecedented in analytical chemistry. And uh, of course, when uh, we, we started to make uh, these uh, polymers more complex, encoding more information, uh, longer uh, stretches, so the, the signals are becoming not as nice. And uh, of course, uh, with the usual, uh, uh, analysis or visually, so we cannot detect, uh, uh, discriminate uh, uh, any of them. So that's why, so uh, again, Luciana, the machine uh, learning expert in the lab, so came up with a clever uh, pipeline for uh, signal processing that is based on, on deep learning, where first we extract uh, the core features of this uh, uh, readout, uh, current readout, and then we pass these through a deep neural network. Uh, uh, trained or multiple uh, uh, polymers uh, that we design uh, to eventually classify uh, polymers uh, that uh, can uh, encode information up to uh, four bits of information, like in this one, from one, two, three, four bits of information. Uh, and uh, actually, the, the, this is uh, so uh, uh, predictable. Uh, while well predicting that we can uh, actually uh, run a really blind uh, test uh, sample uh, work with uh, many different polymers, uh, retrieving actually the, the right uh, composition and also run a uh, kind of a random mixture of, uh, of these uh, polymers together, predicting uh, very well uh, their, uh, their relative ratio, as you can see. So, at the end, in summary, so I, I think that this is a nice example of how these biological bacterial pores uh, can be repurposed uh, with some uh, uh, engineering uh, to approach a completely different uh, uh, function. So uh, the function of reading artificial uh, informational polymers uh, to approach the problem of uh, uh, data storage. And now in, in the lab, we are of course trying to expand uh, uh, after this proof of principle and, 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 and uh, try to read the longer polymers that we encoding uh, more information. And I think that uh, with this, uh, I kind of summarize my talk. So I hope that uh, I convince you that uh, for structural biology, we are experiencing, we are living in a, a very uh, exciting times. And I, 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 my, my dream is that uh, really, uh, before I close my lab, so we can really look uh, at, the, at the cellular level and do structural biology at the, structural, uh, at the cellular level, looking at the, all the cellular processes. Of course, for this, uh, the development of uh, methods, intelligent methods, uh, or based on uh, the new advancement in, uh, in uh, simulation and machine learning uh, are going to be fundamental. And uh, yeah, uh, so all this is not only good for fundamental science, but also for for uh, trying to engineer some of these systems for some uh, medical and uh, technological application, like in the case of uh, aerolizing that I showed you. And with that, so I, I thank the people that uh, actually are, are really doing the work, the, the work that I, I, I propose, the people in my lab, so that I already acknowledge that during uh, the seminar, but also here I acknowledge the whole group and my collaborators at the EPFL uh, and uh, uh, across uh, uh, the world. And with that, I thank you all uh, here and uh, on Zoom for the attention. I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Um, thank you so much for your time today, Matteo. Very interesting talk. I would like to thank also all of you online and on site. Uh, just a brief uh, reminder so the next event coming up. If you haven't seen it, uh, this is the SHAI Summer School coming on June 13th to 14th here on campus. Uh, we still have a couple of places for people to get down if you want to sign up. 
And then we have the AI for Science Day on June 23rd, which is going to take place at the Swiss Tech Convention Center. Uh, if you need more information, just let me know after the talk or look on our website. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have a couple of talks coming up, but uh, that's a couple of weeks' time. So thank you. And we hope to see you all soon again here or online for our next talk. Stay safe and good time.